What's going on, everybody? God bless you. My name is Eric Viatoro. I am the executive director and founder of Delafay Testimonies, and we are on a mission to record one million testimonies for the glory of God. What you're about to see right now is a testimony we recorded in the beautiful land of Thailand. Now, if you didn't know, less than 1% of Thailand's population is Christian. And man, we got the honor to be able to fellowship, uh, to be able to record testimonies out there and now share them with you. And so we recorded about five testimonies that will be put on a playlist on our channel, on our YouTube channel. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure you check out the YouTube channel. And if you're watching from YouTube, then make sure to go to the channel and look at the playlist. I know it's going to be a great blessing to you and your family. So without further ado, enjoy this next testimony. I grew up in an immigrant family where my mom and my dad were working really hard. And if you ask me what was my childhood like, I'd probably say uh, alone. Uh, even though I had an older brother, uh, we were home alone a lot. And I didn't know until later on in my adulthood what effect that have on me. We were home a tremendous amount. Uh, I cook meals for myself. I, I joke around that I played lots of sports all on a screen playing video games. And when I think about that past, uh, what would, why would God pay attention to a chubby Asian kid in the South Bronx? growing up in New York City, scared to go outside because I knew that if I rode my bike around, I could jump for it. Why would God see me? So I grew up in that environment, super dangerous, um, scared, didn't feel safe and stayed home a lot and my parents be out working. Uh, as I grew older, what I realized was happening in me was uh, I began to get angrier, uh, I began to look at myself and not really love myself at all. Uh, I felt like, how do you say, I felt like I was a curse. Uh, I didn't feel that anyone really cared for me or loved me. Uh, I felt abandoned. And what that caused in me was this desire to be strong, to be tough, and to not let anyone step on me or betray me. And so that began to grow in me. At the same time, I grew up in an immigrant family. My parents were from Thailand, and uh, most Thais, if, if you don't know, are Buddhists. And so I grew up going to Buddhist temple for most of my life up into high school. Uh, and I was being taught that being a good person uh, is important. Being taught that if I did bad things, I'd karmically get bad in return. If I did good, blessing would come my way. But I also taught, was taught in the temple that don't be a Christian because they take you away from the family. As I was growing up, I, I found Buddhism attractive. I felt like I could take control of my life. Uh, I did the mantras, I did the meditation, I went to temple. Uh, and when I went to temple, it was to learn Thai also. So I would go there to learn Thai and it was a, both a cultural thing as well as a religious thing. Uh, but I kept on being told that don't become a Christian, but contrasting to and also another teaching they teach is all religions are good. They all teach you to be good people. So I was a little confused by that, but that was what my parents brought me to most of my young life. Uh, it created a shield that I didn't really hear out any other uh, way of thinking or living because I felt like I had control. Now, when I got into high school and I told you that anger was there, that rebellion was there, those feelings of insecurity of being unloved and unworthy were there. Uh, I entered high school and my brother, I remember my brother telling me this. He says, uh, you know, you're gonna go to this high school and they're gonna be Christians there. Uh, don't listen to them. They're just there to brainwash you. And so I took that and I applied that. And whenever I met someone who was a Christian, man, I'd, I'd give it to them. Like I just mocked them or asked questions. They never listened to what they had to say. Did you, uh, just curious here, Rawi, yeah. did you have any understanding of Christianity? Yeah. Like what did, you, what did you know about Christianity? Yeah. So, so actually the beginning, before I entered high school, I went to Catholic school for 10 years. And 
I knew there was a Jesus. I knew there was a Trinity. Uh, I knew the Ten Commandments. I knew some prayers, but none of that led me to a saving knowledge of Christ. It actually led me further into mocking and being against it, if anything. The initial turning point that really was an atomic bomb into my, who I was, who I understood I was, was, uh, you know, I got into high school and then in my junior summer, my brother gives me a call and he goes, yeah, I have something to tell you. I'm like, yeah, what's up? He goes, um, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ right now. I was like, what? You said your, your brother? Yeah. The one who would tell you not to listen? No. To Christian? It, and it, uh, you know, my brother, you know, I looked up to my brother. Uh, my parents, uh, he was like a, another parent to me. Uh, be, growing up in an immigrant family where my brother was the one who spoke English, my parents would rely on him to sort of lead the family and to have him say, you know, don't follow these Christians. And then now he's saying he's a follower of Christ. That was crazy. I didn't know what to do with that. And so he told me that while I was away uh, over the summer. When I got back home, man, my house or my family was at war. Uh, my, my brother was arguing with my parents. My parents were really disappointing him, how he could become a Christian. My mom had uh, you know, asked him this question, you know, as, as Thais, as Buddhists, one of the most important things that the children have to do is to uh, give offering and, and pay homage when our parents pass. And she asked him that question. So now you're a Christian. Are you not gonna show respect to me? And, and for people who don't know what that is, Rawi, when you say pay homage, yeah. uh, what, what is the culture? What is the idea there? So the, uh, it, for Thais, uh, you know, they, Thai Buddhists, they believe in karma, they believe in merit, and uh, it is the role of the children to give merit, to do merit, so that that merit would be sent with the parents into the next life, whether it's incarnation or uh, into enlightenment or in nirvana. Uh, they expected it was the role of the children to do merit, to send the parents off, whether the parents would be reincarnated uh, into a better life or move forward. So you, would you say it was like the good works would um, provide That's right. a better life in the next yeah. life? Yeah. Mm. And even now when uh, you see a, sort of a mixed Buddhism, when every year they have what they would have is a, a day of honoring your ancestors. And there's a mix of Chinese and Buddhism, but they burn like houses and they burn cash and they burn uh, all these materials, cell phones, uh, paper cell phones, uh, in order to offer those things up to their dead uh, ancestors so that they would have a good life. It's an interesting way of looking at things. And so my brother confronting that reality didn't know how to answer that well. And when I got home, I was so confused. On one hand, my parents were Buddhists, said all religions are good, teach how to be a good person. And I'm looking at my parents going, why are you so against uh, my brother who has decided to believe in this and have faith in this? And then I turned to my brother, knowing the Ten Commandments and saying, honor your mom and dad. Why are you arguing with them? Why, why is this happening? And so what that led me in, was into one of the darkest seasons of my life because I let go of everything. I didn't look at myself as a Buddhist anymore, and I wasn't even a Christian, so I didn't have that. And I found myself uh, suicidal. I lost all hope. I, I, I lost who I was. Uh, I lost any bearing of what's truth and what's good. And I was hanging around friends that weren't really good influences e either in my senior year. It's almost like I didn't care anymore. Uh, but there was still a curiosity of why in the world would my brother become a Christian? And so with that, uh, when I entered college, I happened to go to the same college he went to. And I, he introduced me to his church. And it was really weird. I had never been in such an environment before. Uh, it was loving, it was caring, it was welcoming. It was challenging. On one side, I was like, man, why are these people so happy? Why are they so joyful? It's kind of 
like eating too much ice cream. <laughs> but on the other side, it's like, man, what do I, what do I have that I don't have? So I started having questions in college, started asking really hard questions. And, and, and Rawi, just to kind of take it back a little bit here, what was your initial reaction of even being invited to a church now being also, I mean, you were totally against it at some point. Yeah. I would say I love my brother, you know, and, and, and I wanted to understand how he got to this point where he, he moved out of our family traditions and into a, a place where at least when I looked at him, he looked like he was in a better place. It's like, huh, what's going on there? So I wanted to engage that and see what was going on there. I got there and uh, it was my first year of college, started engaging the church, went to Friday fellowship that they had and they studied the Bible. And I'd start asking the hardest questions I'd ask. Uh, the, I remember my first Bible study was uh, Pontius Pilate and Jesus. And I asked, so is Pontius Pilate, you know, because he washed his hands of, of the decision, uh, is he going to heaven? Is he at fault at this? Did he kill Jesus? And man, uh, the person that was leading the Bible said he said something that was so fascinating to me and it, it made me more curious about reading the Bible. Uh, she said this, she said, Ryan, that's a great question. But you know, the Bible doesn't say. And if it, the Bible doesn't say it or explain it, maybe it's not that important. But, but what is the Bible saying to you right now, Raul? Oh man, I was, I was disarmed. I was like, man, that's a fair, fair answer because uh, we're reading this text and trying to figure out what this text is saying, right? Um, and at, at that point, were you already reading the Bible? Like no, it was actually that, that moment was the first time I was actually opening the Bible. Hmm. Yeah, I had no bearings, never read the Bible um, at that time, not, not in any substantive way. Hmm. So it was like a challenge. Yeah, it was, hmm. and I enjoyed it because it, it, it made me go, well, if you wanna really know, come on, seek and find, right? And so uh, in that time, I started, uh, started hitting on a girl uh, and uh, started dating her and, and she was a friend of this Christian community and uh, everyone knew I wasn't a believer. So I, I, at least the women look at me and say, oh, yeah, watch out for this guy. And I remember uh, maybe one week after people started knowing I was dating this girl, I was invited to go to, to this dorm room that a bunch of the Christian girls from that fellowship were living together. And we asked, so, so why are you dating this girl? You love her? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, it's one week, man, she's cute. And they're like, I'm like, well, what do you mean by love? Like, that's a crazy question. And, uh, one of the girls there was super daring. She opened up the scripture uh, to 1 Corinthians and told me to read it. So now hear, the, hear me out. I've never read the Bible before. I don't even know what she's doing. She's saying, here, this is love, Raleigh. Read it. And she, she tells me to read it and I start reading it. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a lot of people, it's a popular verse, but it's the first time, I remember the first time I'm reading it, it goes, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. My response to her after reading that was, you're such idiots, you're so naive. This is impossible. Where, what is this that you just made me read, right? But if I was really truthful, it was in that moment that when I read that scripture, a seed was planted in my heart and it spurred a desire. And the desire said this, that the voice that came out of my heart was, this is what you've been looking for for all your life. Where can we find this? Where can we find love like this? And I would say that something happened. It was just as if in my darkness, in my hopelessness, the sun rose a little bit and you could see the ray of light start shining into my life. And I was like, huh, 
So I started reading the Bible. I didn't know where to begin. I, you know, I, you know, I did the stuff reading from Genesis, and you're like, wow, wow, great story, great story. And then you hit, you know, <laughs> Leviticus, and you're like, what is this? And you just stop reading. But that Christian community kept on engaging me. They kept on preaching the gospel for me. I remember there was this one couple that just took me aside. They're like, Rawi, have you done anything bad in your life? I'm like, absolutely. I was like, you know, when you follow Jesus, the slate is cleaned off. Your past is, is for, in, in any ways forgiven and forgotten by the Lord and you can start a new life. I was like, I've never heard about this before. What I, what I hear, what I've heard all my life was, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. You do good, you get blessed. You do bad, you get cursed. And I was like, you're telling me if I follow Jesus, my past is forgotten and I can live a brand new life? That was intriguing to me. It was really appealing. Uh, but I still, my heart pushed back because I, I had some questions, some, for me, important questions. What, one question was, uh, as a Buddhist, we, we love science. Like we believe that things can be understood in a scientific way, cause and effect. And so I was like, is believing, does believing in God make sense? And for me, I was like, does this make sense if I believed in God? Would I be weird or like, would people think I'm unreasonable? I didn't, I didn't want that. So that was one area that one question I had is believing God makes sense. Another question I had was, now in my childhood growing up in Buddhist faith, my, my mom uh, with the Buddhism that she followed had uh, built in some uh, sorcery and witchcraft. And so I grew up hearing supernatural things, the healing or even cursing, punishing. And I remember one time in my childhood, it's the weirdest thing, it's, it's still very vivid in my mind. I was probably in um, middle school and we came to Thailand and she brought me or my aunt brought us to a witch doctor. And I remember parking this van in what looked like a forest walking into a forest and in the forest there were, there were statues, multitude of statues of male sexual organs. So weird. Walking through that and finally we get to this office and go into the doors like this hut and go into this door and this guy's office. And everyone who went with us, mostly relatives, started getting their fortune told, palm reading, this and that. Now being the youngest there, I was the last one. I was really enthusiastic about this. I was like, yeah, this is cool. And the fortune teller looks at me, he goes, looks at my hand, goes, I can't say anything. My mom was like, what, I'm paying you money. Like, what's going on? Said, I can't say anything. And I'm like, what in the world, what's wrong with you? You just gave everyone, why can't you? She's like, I can't read this person's fortune. I can't read this kid's fortune. I said, why? It's like, there's an aura or a seal about him. And at this point, you're a Christian already? Or no. This was, this was before? This was before. Mm. I was young. I was full on Buddhism. And this person said, this person has a seal on them, some weird aura that's protecting them. I can't read his fortune. And I was, I was angry. It's like, what in the world? Like, we made this trip out and like, I, I'm the only one that, you know, it was really weird. I think, I think at that point, a lie got, an arrow or a lie came hitting my heart and says, you're weird. You're not part of this family. And so I fed into my childhood belief that I was a curse. And so um, going back to college now, I'm reading, reading the Bible, I'm going, what's going on here? That second question is, is this God gonna be more powerful than all that I've experienced as a, as a child growing up. So it's weird, I had this scientific perspective, I hold this spiritual perspective of the supernatural that I knew that there's something supernatural that can inter, in, um, come in and do things. And I think the, the last question that I had was, if I believe in God, would I be loved? Uh, as an adult now, I can ask that question. Back then, I just knew that I just questioned anybody. I, I didn't trust anyone. I didn't. I didn't believe that anyone really cared. 
And if believing in God, would he, would he love me? So those are three things, right? Science, supernatural, and whether I'd be loved and accepted as I am. So I went to college for about three years and uh, I got really sick one winter, like hit the flu. Uh, it was a time again, I felt so alone. My brother had already graduated, moved on to uh, work. Uh, my parents lived about eight hours away from where I was studying. It was frigid cold where we were and I got so sick. I remember sleeping in bed going, I think I'm gonna die. And something just spurred in me said, I think I need to move back to New York City where my parents live. So in the middle of all that transition, uh, I started moving my stuff uh, from, co from university down to New York City. And I remember there was this one time where I drove uh, the most, a really old car. Like it was one of those cars where I didn't know when it was gonna break down. And so every time I did a road trip, I had to get an oil change. So I got an oil change. I went to the same gasoline station I always get an oil change at. And I was sitting there, hour passed, two hours passed, three hours passed, four hours passed. I'm like, what's going on here? He's like, come here one hour, boom, and I get, oil, I get my oil change done. Well, <laughs> there was another guy sitting next to me that was getting his oil change done too. And he was waiting with me the whole time. So into about the second, third hour, he starts striking up a conversation with me. He asked this question, that question, and then he asked this one question. He goes, so, so little brother, um, what religion do your parents believe in? And when he asked that question, I knew, do you to drop the gospel on me in like a couple of sentences? I'd been, sh people had shared the gospels with me so many times, I knew the, the setup. <laughs> I knew the setup. And he, 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 you know, he wound up opening up a little Gideon's Bible. I still have it at my, my house uh, where I keep it uh, near my desk just to remind me of that moment. He opened a little Gideon's Bible and he started doing the Romans road with me and talking about, you know, God is holy and, and perfect and almighty, but we're sinful and broken. And because of that, we're doomed. But God inter comes into the story, comes into our uh, our death and he gives us Jesus Christ that we would believe with him, we could have new life. And then we become his vessel of missions and everything. And I'm like reading this and I'm like, I read the Bible to a certain point where like nothing was new, what he was saying. I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, I, I know, I know. And then he turns to me and he goes, little brother, you say you know all this? So why don't you believe? And it was at that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit take me by my shirt and go, what else do you need, Rawi? So up to that time, I had been testing God. Um, the scientific question, they can, is it reasonable? I was so thankful in college, you know, as I go into different fellowships, uh, they had great speakers. And it was one scientist who came, who was a Christian, who uh, said, God is real. And I'm sitting there as a skeptic, oh, how is he gonna explain this? And he takes a mouse trap, and as he's speaking, he dismantles the mouse trap. And he puts it into a box, closes the box, and starts shaking the box. So you have all you hear all the pieces of this mouse trap shaking in the box. He goes, Hey, who wants to make a bet with me? Let me shake this for another five minutes. Who's willing to bet ten bucks with me that when we open the box, the mouse trap's gonna be put together? And I was like, no one, no one make the bet. Okay, let's let, imagine if I did shook this for 10,000 years, who would be willing to bet me a million dollars that when we open it up, it'll be a mouse trap? Still no one. And it made me, dawned in me the reality of God and creation, that how sophisticated is the human body? Looking at the eye, looking at the, the organs, looking at all these little things, things and did this all happen by coincidence, by some random shaking of things coming together? No, obviously someone had to open that box and put the mouse trap together. And so I was like, wow, okay. God is a creator. There was another time where I was reading my Bible and I had lots of questions about creation continuing on. And for some reason, I, I, I didn't know how to read the beginning so I read Revelation instead, and Revelation confused me even more. 
But one picture that was there was the picture of Jesus. And while I was reading, I, I wasn't a believer yet. I said, wow, that's Buddha. And at that retreat while I was reading that, another retreat, the speaker there who was an MIT uh, researcher said, Rawi, um, I'm not sure where you're getting that from. Uh, you, it looks like you're taking your past and you're looking at it from your past when the Bible is just the Bible. It's asking you to take it as it is. And so that began to teach me about looking at things more scientifically, just as it is, what's happening just as it is. And began to read the Bible differently. Really been, began to read the Bible without this framework of uh, Buddhism or uh, my expectation. Just going, what is it saying? Who is this Jesus that is talking about? Supernaturally now, what was happening? There was three instances, crazy instances for me, um, that when I think about it, it still gives me goosebumps. So I was being challenged by the church to believe in God. And uh, I broke up with that girl. <laughs> broke up with that girl. <laughs> and I uh, feel a little depressed about it. And I took a run to this field. The uh, field was huge. It, had like, it was like four or five baseball fields. So I took a run out to that field, went to the farthest end and faced this forest. There's a bunch of trees. I was like, wow, I'm all alone here. I said, all right, God, if you're real, show yourself. And the minute I made that request, the second I made that request, birds, it felt like thousands upon thousands of birds just came rushing out of the forest. It was utterly quiet before that. I'm looking at a plume of birds who, who just responded to this challenge. I got so scared, I ran away. I, I ran away going, God, is that you? You seriously listen to my prayer? Another time was, I locked my keys in my car. And I told you my car is this old car. Uh, and I was knocking on this car. This is one of those old cars that if you knocked on the car, maybe the, the, the door locks might open. <laughs> so, so I was running to a final, locked my keys in a car, went and took my final, came back trying to open the door. Knocking on the door, knocking on the door. Did it, walked around the car dozens of times, trying to figure out how to get this thing open. And it dawned on me, well, God, if you're real, help me get this door open. And the moment I prayed that, I stepped on a, a metal rod that was perfect to stick in, I'm from the Bronx, right? Stick through my door and pop the lock. And I was like, what the heck is this? It's like, God, are you real? And it came to that air conditioner repairman who, it was a Friday that that happened where I'm talking to this air conditioner repairman, challenging me, challenging me why don't you believe? And so I drive my car out uh, to a church. I was gonna go meet a bunch of my friends who are Christians. And I, after that experience, that, rare, that air conditioner repairman, I, I sat in the parking lot of that church. I said, God, if you're real, if you want me to be a Christian, you have your chance tonight. And if you don't answer, I'm not following. I'm gonna stay as far away as a church as I can, and Christians as I can. And I had three questions about if I became a believer, first is, I don't wanna be a hypocrite. I don't wanna become a Christian and live two different, different lives. How, how, Lord, can you transform me? The second question I had was on the lines of, I still love my old life. I love the party. I love going out with friends. I love doing things that I know aren't good for me. I don't know how I'm gonna turn from those things. I've, how, how is it possible that I'm gonna stop loving these things? I've been loving them for years. And then the third one was just, if I follow you and I fail, will you abandon me? Will you reject me? Will you judge me? And uh, I walked into the Bible study that Friday night at fellowship. And because I was like a visitor, I, I wound up in the pastor's Bible study. And he opened up uh, in Colossians and it was the theme of uh, taking off and putting on. 
uh, my challenge to God was I had these three questions, but God, I'm not going to ask them, but I want you to answer them. And so I tried to create this impossibility. And I walk into this fellowship and we start reading that passage in Colossians. The pastor asks the question, something around the same question and then answers it from scripture. And the first time it happened, I was like, no way, can't be, it's a coincidence. Second time it happened, I was like, oh my God, God is, this, is this you really answering me? Third time, I was just sitting numb in my chair at that Bible study going, oh, this is for real. God, you're answering me. And so when the Bible study was, I didn't say anything to anyone. I just stepped quietly into the sanctuary of the church. I remember exactly where I sat, bowed my knee down and said, God, I believe in you, you're real. I give my life to you. Please lead me and take me and care for me. I have no other choice now. Three months later, so I was trying to read my Bible like fervently, just I felt like I had to catch up to all these Christians. And there was one night while I was doing a devotion and uh, I opened up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I hadn't read it in almost four years since that first time in freshman year. Now I was a senior in college. I open up that passage. I start reading it. Love is patient, love is kind, and on and on and on. And as I read it, I felt something pour into my heart. I don't know what it was. You know, I now know it's, I believe that to be the Holy Spirit really doing doing inner healing in my life, but he, the, that love came into my life. And I started crying. I was in bed alone, crying, crying, crying. This, this mix of uh, who I was and now who I am in God and how, how he loved me. And I prayed back, I, 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 I was able to collect myself. I said, God, you've loved me like this. You've loved me so well. You love me with a perfect love. How do I respond? And I heard a voice. And it was the craziest thing. I, you know, I, brand new believer, I, you know, just start reading my Bible like as a believer. And I heard this voice says, you will go to your parents' homeland and preach the gospel. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't, you know, I'd been in church long enough to know what missions is. You know, I, I'm trying to learn to pray and read. And I was like, what is this? But God gave me that prophetic vision, that voice that set and framed the next 20 years of my life. And so I wonder if that love ever changes. I always wonder as I came to that point, I think, I think we, when you become a believer for the first time, there's this honeymoon period where God is so real and you're on fire. But I found myself as I, into my second and third year, that that fire, that flame started to dwindle. My old life started creeping back in. And God keeping reminding me, You're, I'm not giving up on you. I've saved you. And so God continuing. The, the picture I've always gotten in my spiritual life, whenever I feel at my weakest, is God's hand going, come, come away with me. Come, grab my hand, let's go. And it's that picture that keeps me going, keeps me following Jesus, that he's never stopped inviting me to grab my hand. Let's come away, let's go. I have an adventure, I have a journey for you to experience my love, my care, my protection. So much so that eventually I wound up becoming a missionary. Uh, 10 years later, after that prophetic voice, the Lord said, it's time, you need to move to Thailand. I had a pretty successful career in IT. Uh, I loved my work and God said, it's time to go. And I, I, and I remember my prayers, like I belong to you, I surrender to you, lead me. And he said, go, I dropped everything. And I moved back at that time, I got married, had two kids. We all just packed up and moved. 
to Bangkok, Thailand, where we've been here since 2013. If I had to say something about Jesus today, oh, he is so sweet. He is so good. You know, I, there's all this skepticism out there these days. And one thing that I, I've held on to deeply was um, Jesus is that, you know, as I was thinking about missions, Jesus, uh, the first time Jesus sends his people on missions is in Matthew 28. He says the great commission, right? He goes, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them all I have taught you. And lo, behold, I will be with you always to the end of the age. That passage uh, begins actually with Jesus calling his disciples to him and they worship him as the resurrected Jesus. And what's really odd to me about that passage is even though they see this Jesus who they saw dead on the cross, who loved them and saved them on the cross, and now he's risen and alive, it says some doubted. If I were to confess, there's a lot of doubt in me. There's still questions. And as I've walked with people and, and, and tried to live this, this uh, command, this commission to make disciples, I think everyone has questions. And I wanna say that Jesus is bigger than those questions and he's gentle and he desires to answer those questions. If you have questions, if you have doubts, whether you're a believer already or you're, 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 you're interested, you're curious about the faith, you have questions, that's proof for me that God is pursuing you. Another way of, that I've defined doubt is truth seekers. If you have doubts and you, want, you have questions, you want them answered, to me, what you are is a truth seeker. And I know that this Bible tells me that the truth, the, the truth of all truths can be found in Jesus Christ. Come to him. He'll answer all your questions and not just answer your questions. He'll care for you. He'll love you. He'll protect you. He'll walk with you. He'll transform you. That's the Jesus that I've experienced. And that's the Jesus that has transformed my life from one without hope to one that I have joy now. Life's not perfect, but Jesus is there and he walks with me and I can have joy in those challenges of life. I wanna invite you to that. Come and, come and experience the true and living Jesus who walks with us. Now, Rawi, you mentioned that when your brother came to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He had a really hard time with his parents. And I'm just curious as to what that dynamic looked like for you mm. with your parents and with your brother. Now, both of you guys uh, being Christian, but we'll start with your parents. Yeah. I, um, I remember when I first came to faith, uh, what happened was uh, someone bought me a cross. So I wore a cross. And the first thing my mom saw when I walked into the house was I was wearing a cross. He says, you're a Christian now? I'm like, yeah. And she asked the same exact questions. Are you going to do merit for me when I die? And I kind of thank God that my brother went through this first because I, I thought about that question. <laughs> I looked at my mom and said, mom, of course, if, if that's what you want. But can I ask you a question in return? Would you rather me honor you when you're dead or honor you now and love you now? and show you respect now because Jesus that's in my life now is teaching me to do this the right way. I wanna honor you and love you as you should because you're my mom, so choose. And she couldn't say anything. And uh, I think over time, I, you know, I, I had a rough start and there was a lot of stuff God had to transform in me. I still argued with my parents. And it was only when I became an adult, had my own family, had my own children, and began to realize, wow, they, being parents is hard. A lot of things going on. And I began to empathize and realize, man, uh, they had a hard time. They were working really hard uh, to, to make ends meet. And they, they did that for my, my future. And so now I'm in a place with them where uh, I openly share about my faith. They're not Christians yet. I, I believe they will be. I think they've seen some 
crazy things to that they they don't know how to answer from a human sense their their faith doesn't answer doesn't know a way to answer that and i just i and my brother are there just witnessing and saying maybe that's god these days you know what i ask my parents is have you talked to god lately like how do you talk to god I'm like just talk to him when you're alone just ask him some questions just talk to him and see if god might answer uh, used to be like I had to give them a theological argument or I had to share the gospel. At this point, I was like, man, I think they've seen enough from my brother's life, my life, that uh, I think they just need to experience God for themselves. So I, you know, I asked them that question. I know that they'll push back a little bit, but I keep on asking that question. Well, my brother, um, he got married, has, two ne- has, has born two nieces for me. <laughs> uh, he's still walking in the faith. Uh, he had a rough spot, I think, after uh, he graduated. And I became, a, it was weird, when I became a believer is where he needed encouragement to grow in his faith. And uh, it was actually uh, at my wedding or out soon after my wedding that his own girlfriend came to faith too. And so uh, he got married to a believer. Uh, and I just want to say it's kind of a miracle. If you know the statistics in Thailand, uh, there are not many Christians that are Thai uh, I think there's uh, less than 1%. Yeah. And so think about two Thai Americans marrying two beautiful women that are Christians also. It, it beats all the odds. It, it's, I look back and I go, that's God right there because statistically that's not possible. And so I give thanks to God and praise to God and how he's led me in my journey and the role of my brother in his journey. Uh, keeping us in the faith and walking with Jesus. Rawi, who is Jesus to you? Wow, man, he's my Lord and my Savior. He's the person that walks with me uh, in all the good and all the bad of life. He's with me always. He reminds me of who I am. He gives me power through his Holy Spirit to serve him. Uh, He He's that hand that when I feel lost is always reached out and goes, come, take my hand, come away with me. I have a journey for you. I have a story for you to live out. And so uh, Jesus is uh, what gives me purpose and value in my life. And you mentioned you, you've been in Thailand now for 10 years? Over 10 years. Over 10 we, years. We arrived 2013. And uh, I've been serving here, doing pastoral care, uh, doing disciple making, uh, helping plant churches, and helping to form leaders for the church. What would you say to, to that 1% that loves Jesus, that's after the gospel, that wants to share the gospel and is feeling discouraged, knowing that they are that 1% and there's um, difficulties and trouble in that. Yeah. I, I would say actually, whether you're that 1% in Thailand or you're anywhere in the world right now, as I read that Matthew passage in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth are now mine. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Uh, as I've gotten older in the faith, the the command to make disciples becomes louder and louder, not because it's my thing that I have to do, but because I understand that Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, and he promises all the believers he will be with them always. And with that reality, how can we not go out and share about Jesus? How can we not go out and uh, help people come to know and follow Christ? And so I want to encourage you that if you want to see the presence of God in real ways, the presence of Jesus Christ moving you forward, leading you, commit yourself to what he says to go do. And that's to worship him. That's to go and make disciples. That's to read his scripture, learn about who he is and live as the Bible tells you to live. And you will experience his power. You will experience his presence in in ways that you could never imagine because that's what's happened in my life as I've, I've tried my best but understood that as much as I try to pursue Jesus, as little as as much, his pursuit of me is overwhelming. 
Rawi, could you take a moment and pray for everyone who's watching right now that it's saying, I, I want to take up on that call. I want to fulfill that call in my life to go and make disciples of all nations. Could you just pray for them as they watch right now? Yeah. The word of God says that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. If you're lost right now, if you feel you don't have purpose in life, the word of God says that the character of Jesus is that he will leave the 99 to go after that one sheep that's lost. If you feel that you are that one sheep that's gone astray, that's lost their way, that doesn't know where to go, I want to tell you the scripture says that Jesus is pursuing you. And if you want to respond, Lord, please help them to stop and to turn to you, Lord. Help them to stop and receive your care, your love, your protection. Lord, give them the courage to turn away from what they, how and how they've lived and Lord, receive the embracing arms of Jesus to carry them and bring them back home. Lord, please, Jesus, change their lives. Allow your Holy Spirit to experience your love and your care in their life. Help them to know that they've never really been lost, that Christ has always been there to pursue them and to bring them back to himself. Lord, I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Rawi, any last words for those who are watching your testimony right now? I feel as a side, it's something that's spurred up in me is if, if you feel like God's calling you into the mission field, I want to encourage you and tell you that God, if, if that's God calling you, he will care for you and protect you. God has showed himself to me to supply and to care and to give me all that I need to serve him. And so if you're called to missions, whether it's to be a missionary to your neighborhood, to the neighbor across the road, across the street, or some crazy place overseas, overseas like Thailand, I want you to know that God will supply and carry you and walk alongside you in that whole endeavor of discovering your calling and living out that calling that comes from Him. Hi, family. Thank you so much for watching and supporting Della Faith Testimonies. You may be wondering, who are these people listed on the screen? Well, these are all of the people who donated in the month of August towards the production of these testimonies. As a special thank you, we've decided to highlight your names at the end of each testimony for the entire month of September. You may or may not know, but we are a crowdfunded ministry that is fueled by your support. So if you would like to partner with us and see your name in the ending credits for the month of October, head over to missiondelafe.org, donate whatever amount the Lord leads you to give, and check back next month to see your name on the screen. Thank you again for all of your prayers, your comments, for sharing and encouraging us as we continue towards the goal of sharing one million Jesus testimonies. God bless you.